I don't need to remind any of you how much of a mess 2020 was beyond this opening sentence, but man, thank the slayer we had video games. What a year this has been for interactive entertainment. We had glorious comebacks of long beloved series, two very different franchises found some camaraderie, VR got a little more accessible, Cyberpunk 2077 came out, Yep, and brand new consoles launched that no one can buy. Now here we are on the eve of 2021, a year sure to bring more hype, surprises, controversy, and joy from a medium we love so very, very much. But before we go screaming into the future, I wouldn't mind taking a second to appreciate a bit of the past. What's up everybody, I'm Kirk, and today I'm keeping this video simple. These are my top 5 games of 2020. Just a heads up, I'm only featuring games I reviewed on this channel, and that obviously came out in 2020. Although, I'll list some of my other favorites in the description in case some of you are curious. Please keep in mind, this is my own personal, very subjective list. I'm not looking for anybody to agree or disagree with me here. And to be frank, this whole video is just an excuse to talk about games I love and make some cool edits. However, I would like to know your favorite games of 2020, your own top 5, top 10, whatever. Tell me about the games that made an impact on you in 2020. And who knows, if you mention one that I haven't played, it could end up in a video someday. With that, let's kick back our feet, crack a beverage of choice, and reminisce. Twenty twenty was an absolutely fantastic year for first person shooters, and Proteus was the perfect punctuation. Proteus takes everything that made 90 shooters classic and gives them a modern day spit shine. No, the game doesn't do anything particularly new, but what it does, it does very well. Slick, thunderous shooting mechanics with an arsenal of weapons that are so much fun to use. For some players, it was the Doom 3 they always wanted, but I think the real beauty of Proteus is that it can be whatever kind of shooter you want it to be, due in no small part to the powerful in-game map editor. Proteus is already saturated with maps built by its passionate community, featuring gorgeous, creative, combat-heavy levels and more unique truck-hopping fare. Proteus is still in early access, and the game definitely has some design quirks to iron out. However, what's currently on offer is more than enough for me to recommend it to any gamer that loves their shooters fast and pixelated. Oh, I can't wait to see what's next for this one. Did it go? You bet! Bring it on! Why yes, I did review Final Fantasy VII on this channel. Something you should know about me is that my two favorite gaming genres are first-person shooters, which I shifted much of this channel's focus to, and RPGs. And Final Fantasy is my favorite RPG series. I'll be honest though, I didn't have high expectations for Final Fantasy VII Remake. You better be worth the money, Merc. Every last gill. I figured the game would be fun, but it was hard to imagine it meeting or exceeding the excellence of the original. Oh boy, was I wrong. Final Fantasy VII was a nostalgia nuke that blew me through the back of my seat. Square Enix actually managed to recreate the magic of FF7 and breathe new life into it. The look, the feel, the characters, everything feels correct. And the new additions, while not all home runs, are welcome to see. That'll do! Can you take over for Damn. me? Square also managed to finally create a battle system that balanced real-time combat with the strategy the series is known for. And while we haven't seen the full extent of it, it's great to see the Materia system from the original preserved and improved upon. Now, while much of the original experience was lovingly recreated, Square did make some bold new choices with the plot, to the point where it's debatable whether or not this is a remake or a most unusual sequel. Personally, I've come to embrace these changes as they seem to have some larger connections to the Final Fantasy VII franchise on the whole, but admittedly, it does make me a little nervous for the upcoming parts. Either way, Final Fantasy VII is one of the best single-player Final Fantasy experiences to come in some time. Jesus Christ, Joel. What do you do? I 
saved her. There's a lot of noise surrounding The Last of Us Part 2. Before it was released, there was noise. After it was released, there was noise. And it's noise that I choose to tune out. All that matters to me is what my experience with the game was. And for me, The Last of Us Part 2 was nothing short of incredible. <laughs> Going into this wildly anticipated sequel, I was well aware the game's central theme was hate. What I didn't expect was how much of my own hateful feelings would factor into the narrative. <laughs> Part 2 introduced us to Abby, a villain whose beefy arms would make Popeye blush. Naughty Dog does a great job making the player absolutely despise this character. You don't get to rush this. <laughs> All they'll want is to help a vengeful Ellie put this girl's head on a stick. But then halfway through the game, the devs pull a fast one, making Abby the main playable character, and thus puts the player in the uncomfortable position of empathizing with the person they've grown to loathe. It was a ballsy choice, but it's central to what makes this game so great. Last of Us Part 2 is not for everyone, even those who enjoyed the first game. Its narrative is one of the most challenging and upsetting to ever grace the medium largely making the player feel horrible and conflicted. So if you're a person who has a low tolerance for that in your media, stay far away from this game. But for those that appreciate narratives that explore the grayest of gray zones, they will discover a compelling, layered, and heartbreaking tale about how hate, revenge, and the cycle of violence will ultimately lead to our own destruction. It's the type of storytelling usually reserved for novels and film. And for a game to step into this territory is a good sign that gaming is still pushing boundaries and striving to be a deeper art form. Seriously, how high up are we going? Now, after that wild stream of compliments, some of you might be wondering why this isn't my top pick. Well, as much as I did enjoy Part 2's brutal, stealthy gameplay, I felt it was missing some key stealth mechanics that would have made it a little more enjoyable. And in general, I wish the gameplay evolved more throughout the 25-hour experience, because once you get into the final acts, the game can start to feel a little stale. It's time-consuming. <laughs> The Last of Us Part 2 is a game I'll forever cherish, but at the end of the day, it just wasn't as fun as my next two picks. Sometimes an idea comes along that is so good you can't help but wonder why nobody stumbled across it before. In the case of Ultra Kill's developer, Hakita, it was taking the brutal mechanics of classic FPSs like Quake and slapping it together with the stylish action of Devil May Cry. My god, does that premise make for one hell of a game. Ultra Kill is the game where you can shoot a shotgun, punch the ammo as it flies out, and then watch it rocket towards your enemy and explode, after which the game tells you how cool it was. This game is nuts. It is room after room of stylish carnage, set to one of the most addicting soundtracks that I'm still obsessed with. The dopamine was practically gushing out of my ears, and it's still in early access. They're not even done with it yet, and it's better than most of the games I've played this year. And to top it all off, the game is one of the most unique interpretations of the Inferno you'll ever come across. If any bit of this game looks awesome to you, then go download it right now. Ultra Kill's publisher, New Blood, claims to hate money, but I think we should give them more so they put this gem on more systems. I don't care how much of a shill I sound like, more people need to know about this game. I debated heavily on whether or not Ultra Kill was my favorite game of 2020. But while it rips and tears at me a little, when all is said and done, there was one other game that simply had its hooks in me a little deeper. Against all the evil that hell can conjure, all the wickedness that mankind can produce, we will send unto them only you. Rip and tear until it is done. Doom Eternal, the game so nice, I reviewed it twice. I have said many things about Doom Eternal throughout this year, and if I had to sum them all up, I'd say this. This game is a fucking blast. 
With Doom 2016, id Software found a way to breathe new life into this franchise by bringing it back to its roots and improving on the mechanics that made id shooters so great in the first place. With Eternal, that experience was honed and sharpened into one of the most insane, explosive, and mechanically sound first-person shooters to ever smash into our gaming platforms of choice. As brutal and chaotic as Doom Eternal looks, it's a rather elegant experience. Everything is at the player's disposal to succeed as long as they keep their focus on pure offense. Low on health, glory kill. Low on ammo, chainsaw. Low on armor, flame belch. The game challenges the player to keep their attention on multiple things at once, and it can make for a very difficult experience. But once you get into the flow, ugh, it's Nirvana. Plus, if you choose to pay attention to it, Eternal expands on Doom's epic lore in ways that will make longtime hardcore fans cheer. Yes, cheer. <sighs> Now, this alone was enough to keep Doom fans satiated, but then it put out the first of its two-part DLC, The Ancient Gods, which managed to make the Eternal experience more insane and more difficult, and I loved every freaking second of it. And just when you thought it couldn't get better, Panic Button puts out a magnificent port of the game on the Nintendo Switch, making it so we can rip and tear anywhere. Doom Eternal is a masterpiece. It is everything I hoped a sequel to Doom 2016 would be, and then some. And I have yet to tire of it. And it is my favorite game of 2020. There you have it, my top five games of 2020. Now, before we wrap up, I have one last thing to say, and it is easily the most important thing I will say in this video. Thank you. In fact, let's make that text bigger. Nope, bigger. Bigger. Okay, imagine your screen is but one pixel making up the planet-sized thank you I have for all of you. 2020 was the first year of this channel, and my sole goal for this year was to end it with at least 1,000 subscribers. So to end the year approaching 10,000 is pretty overwhelming. Look, compared to other channels, mine is tiny, but the fact that there are close to 10,000 of you who went, sure, I'll listen to what this doofus has to say every week, is something I don't take lightly or for granted, and your support means the absolute world to me. And motivates me to work even harder and keep improving. All I want this channel to be is a good distraction, a break from the stresses of every day to indulge in some constructive content for a medium we all love. And going into 2021, I plan to keep that ball rolling. So you, my wonderful audience, can expect reviews of new and old games, video essays with all the fancy edits, and yes, more docs with correct pronunciations. Apologies to Shreveport. You are all a ton of fun to make videos for, and I am excited to show you what's next. So once again, thank you. Just a reminder, please be sure to let me know your top games of 2020 in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe, like, and share with your friends. It is a massive help for this channel. If you'd like to see my reviews for all the games featured, go ahead and check out my reviews playlist. I post videos weekly, so be sure to ring that bell so you're the first to see them. I'm Kirk, and thank you for watching this video. Stay safe out there.